<laughs> wait, would you wait an endless piss take from that? Oh yeah, it's coming. Ah, all right. Yeah. For me, I don't think there was a great moment of inspiration to, to kind of join this industry. I fell into it through a few murky years pretending to be at university and, and I got to the end of when I was supposed to graduate and had to prove that I hadn't wasted three years of my life in, in a nightclub and so uh, I thought I'd better try and make a go of it. A little bit more talent in the monitors, please. I'm Will Harold. I'm one of the founders and owners of LWE. I'm Paul Jack, and I'm one of the founders and directors of LWE. How come you're a director? I don't know if I'm a... <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I'm a person. <laughs> LWE is a, an underground electronic music promoter. You know, we put on events from 500 people in tiny spaces right through to mega raves in six, 7,000 capacity warehouses and car parks and disused buildings around London. And eventually we've grown into being festival promoters as well that are yeah, anywhere between sort of 10 to 20 to 30,000 people now. Me and Will came together. I was doing parties at Matter where we're all the head of music. I was doing one of the last shows, or it was the last show, in the venue when it was closing down. We kind of sat there looking at it, going, what are we going to do with this event? It's sold out. Um, me and Will kind of partnered off and moved it to a different venue, into a warehouse space. And that kind of was the birth of LWE. There was two things, I think, going on in London at the time when LWE started. There was this kind of club land being dominated by major venues, and so you had Ministry, Cross, Key, Canvas, Turnmills. There, I mean, there was a list of like big clubs that were rammed every Saturday and, and had, had their own scenes going on. At the same time, there was this underbelly of really interesting sort of stuff going on with people like Secret Sundays, and they were doing great little warehouse parties, but they were really underground, and it would feel kind of quite DIY. We really focused on the detail of the production and bringing that control to those kind of raw, more kind of DIY spaces. And I think that the combination of, of putting amazing artists into, into really unusual spaces has been absolutely paramount to, to our journey. Everywhere I'd worked before was in a venue and, and so we would always be going out and looking for talent to fit in these four walls and we'd be programming a lineup to fit in whatever the venue was. Whereas now we were going out and we were going to talk to talent and going, cool, what kind of space do you want to play in? And I think that was really empowering for them to turn it back around and go, okay, you want to play in like this incredible white photographic studio and make this kind of like amazing disco party, great. Or you want to play in this edgy, raw, like kind of water dripping from the ceiling tunnel underneath the what, some railway station, great, let's go and do it. Talk us through some of your most notable events to take doing Skrillex's first UK show. That was a scary yeah. show we went on. We booked, booked him. Booked him. He exploded literally the week before the show. He was, Everyone he's, he's, bought tickets he, for him. He started being like fifth on the bill. I'm like, he was totally unknown in the UK. Well, relatively unknown in the UK. But we could see what was happening in America and it was just like In the second room, we had Disclosure. Yeah. Uh, I think it was Disclosure, Marabou State, Red Light and someone else yeah, in the I mean, playing room too. It, 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 was, it was literally and it was a show <laughs> full of festival headliners. Yeah. I think the other thing that was quite mad on that date was that um, by the time we got to the show day, Skrillex had every single track in the top 10 on Beat, in the top 10 on Beatport. He had every single track, which I don't know if anyone's done that since. We well, did, it was we one did. of the scariest ones. I mean, the, the crowd <laughs> went so mad on the dance floor. There was me, Will, Alice and our team holding back the, the, the pit barriers with our, with our arms and, le and feet just jammed against them. They were they're moving the barriers forward, so we're like looking at the stage, looking at the barriers, looking at the crowds, just going, we might have to stop the show. But We did three, like, we did, we did three show stops that yeah. night. We stopped the music, lights up, can everyone take a step back, take a breath, make sure everyone around you is all right. Started again and just fucking all chaos just descended. <laughs> The show could have been a goner though. Yeah. It was pretty exciting, but it was one of those things that you book an act that at the time is, is no one, 
relatively speaking, and, and then by the time you get the show day, you've got a whole different animal on your hand. I think the other thing to talk about is, is Junction 2. Junction 2 was, I mean, that was, that was our baby really, wasn't it? Out of, out of, out of, yeah, it still out, is. I mean, it still is. And I think out of everything, the whole team has been so heavily invested in it, sort of emotionally, that it's something that we've always challenged ourselves with that one to really kind of raise the bar. And it's the one we would never even think about compromising on. Was it year two or year three where we lost such a heinous amount of money? Uh, I think we lost money on most years. Uh, <laughs> well, we, lost, we lost a little bit in year one. Yeah, no. year one we lost money. Yeah, year two. Yeah, year two we made money. And year three we lost year an absolute shame. We lost, lost that mountain of money. I mean, we could have bought a house each for what we lost, yeah. but actually I was really fucking happy. A lot of people don't really realise, but we, we knew we had something special and we were absolutely determined to do it again. And as much as a lot of other people probably would have turned and run away from it, we just knew we had something special and it's just kept getting better. LWE is a lot more than just us two and there's 20 full-time staff that sit in here and there's countless other freelancers and I think if you take something like I know, Junction 2 as an example, you've got 15 people in the artist liaison team who are dealing with getting their artists and their tour managers and all those things on to site, getting them across site to their stages, making sure that they're looked after, happy, that their technical riders right, that there's a there's a tech on every stage and a stage manager and two sound guys and there's a lighting guy and a video guy and then there's all the other people that you don't think about. There's 35 people taking tickets on the door and there's 200 plus security. There's another 150 stewards out on the street that are just making sure you get to the tube station. There's over a thousand people pieces of signage that goes up and have to be taken back down again. There's all the people that deal with the resident liaisons trying to make sure that we minimise our impact for all the logistics. We haven't even got into the operations team and there's people that run the bars and that run the toilets and make sure the food traders are there and they're all, they're, all, the, all their fryers have been pat tested and all, all the other things. There's the power boys and trackway and fencing and I mean the list just goes on and on and on. So I think big shout out to all those people who are really don't often get recognised because there's a, there's a hell of a lot more to LWE than just us two. The, the partnerships that work best are where, where the brands are sympathetic to, to what, what an event is. They have an understanding of the music scene and the scene they're looking to be involved with. And so they work with you collaboratively. You're essentially trying to work and, and, and give something back to the audience. And you'd much rather have a present from, from one of your mates who really understands you than you would from your super rich mad auntie who's going to buy you a 600 pound sweater you don't fucking want. So if you bring that back to brand partnerships, then it's the same analogy, you know, you need to, you need to know what people want and why you're giving it to them and that, that, that they'll appreciate it rather than, yeah, wandering around looking like a dick in a sweater you don't want. It kind of became clear to us Junction 2, the festival, wasn't going to happen. And I think it shone a light on the industry in a, in a way that showed how fragile an ecosystem it is and how we've all been just a bit set in our ways, really, repeating and doing the same thing and not ready to adapt and move with, with something like this happening. And it's accelerated uh, what, what people are doing outside of events, physical events taking place specifically and developing other strategies. What we knew is we didn't want to put a live stream out simply for the sake of a live stream. Uh, it, it had to have purpose, meaning, it had to look different, it had to celebrate, I guess, what we meant by Junction 2. So we created a, a bit of a digital landscape for it and called it J2V. And so trying to recreate a event experience is, is what we went out to do with J2V. And creating that bridge between digital and realities is also very much at the heart of what we are working on with our, with our VR projects at the moment. It's a different dimension and adds a different layer to it. And I think that we've, as promoters, always been searching for sort of what next, you know, and when we ran out of venues, we, we dived into bigger spaces that we weren't sure that would work, or when we have come up against these challenges, we've not been afraid to go and push the boundaries a little bit, and I think that's, that's what keeps us going as promoters, is trying to find the edge and have a little look over it. It's escapism, and it's, it's exactly, this is just digital escapism, and it's just the next chapter for us in terms of our journey. I think the thing that I'll probably tell myself, and, and I think we generally we've managed to do it reasonably anyway but is to to trust your gut and and there's this the the, the odd time that we've done things where we're like oh i don't know about this it's, it's that's inevitably when it's blown up in our faces anytime we're all like yes that's the one and you've got that spring in your step and you just like you can't wait to pick up the phone and phone an agent and you can't wait to show someone around a venue and you just know when you when, when it's right telling myself it's going to be difficult i think kind of understanding it from the start do I, would I have wanted to know that? Probably not, actually. I mean, I think, I think 
going head on slightly blind blind to what is coming it was part of the adventure I find and it, in reality the difficulties that come with it if you knew it ahead you may have not done it I mean but but actually the end result and plowing through it and taking it as it comes has been great finding the sparkle of a, of, of a kind of diamond in the rough is, is 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 key as well and seeing the things that are beautiful in, in, and actually appreciating them and, and appreciating the, the just the simple things of like the contrast if you've got kind of a, a beautiful site in Boston Manor Park and then you've got this kind of massive concrete bridge thundering through the middle of it and I, I think those kind of those those juxtapositions are, are, are exciting and interesting and what makes our events different is we, we, we search those out. Yeah and pe people I think when they go out what they are looking for is an experience and that experience is set by the setting they go into and doing something unusual. And, and, then, they, and then they can take a selfie. And then they can take a selfie. <laughs> and bang on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs>